like I said, runtime's about 45 minutes start to finish, and that's with some Q&A at the end. Um, I use this class to help people get into the mindset, and um, we're definitely going to talk about hands-on features, uh, starting off here with the definition of macro, just so we can get the terminology right and we can get into our minds of what does macro mean and what does that image look like. Secondly, um, I'm gonna take a couple of slides and actually explain the features of our 90 macro because um, in the field, when I'm working with other photographers, we get a lot of questions about what do all the switches and dials mean and, and how can that help you with the type of photos you want to shoot. There's gonna be some insect tips in that section as well. And then the, the second portion or the second half of, of my presentation is all about home, uh, home photography, shooting out in the field. You know, again, when I, when I go out to photograph macro, it's going to be, you know, I'm gonna look for light. I'm gonna check my backgrounds. I'm gonna give you tips on photographing flowers because that's a very common subject that I find people like to shoot. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about jewelry as well because that's another very common genre of macro photography that I get a lot of technical questions on. All in all, um, there is a great extension to this class in our video section on our website. So Tamron last week or the week before started a new section on their website called Homeschool. And Ben, if you wouldn't mind putting that link in the chat for everybody so they can check it out. Um, this is a section where we've been putting all of our created online content over the last three or four weeks. So not only will you find interviews from our image masters, um, interviews with our tech team, myself, Erica, Ken, Jeff Allen, Armando, you know, all your favorites from here in Team Tamron. Um, my specific one on macro is five actual setups of different things that you can photograph at home. So I know Ben was giving you guys a teaser on Instagram with, with the splash photo and the thumbtack and, and the little cups there. Um, we also go over like match photography, how to photograph those flames. Um, and then I talk extensively on extension tubes there because I know that's a topic that always comes up in this class and uh, we just don't have the time to really delve into that in detail. Um, but these are great videos. They run anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes. So they're, they're not a long, long ask, but uh, definitely find some that, that interest you and check them out. Thank you, Ben. Let's start off here with the definitions. So we start with definitions. We talk about, you know, what is macro photography? Why is this important and why does it matter? Um, and it's a conversation that I have all the time and it goes from the artistic conceptual to the actual really technical nitty gritty ratios and, and focal lengths and compression and all this stuff. Um, at the end of the day, don't ever get too bogged down with with the, the technical definition, you know, I'm looking for a specific one to two ratio or one to one ratio or what specific angle of view or magnification am I going to have with this combination? Um, at the end of the day, just try to vision what you want your photograph to look like and does your gear get you there? And I know how do we best get there without a lot of stress and a lot of setup. In a, in a technical sense, when we talk about macro photography, it is a true one-to-one -one representation of the image if you were to place it on the sensor. So um, it's 100% it's life-size representation. I like to use the example here of a quarter. We all know what a quarter looks like. We all know about how big that is. We are literally looking at the world in inch-by-inch inch sections at a time. Now, if you were to look at your sensor of your digital camera, whether it's full frame or crop sensor or something like that, to get true macro, we're going to open up our camera so we can see the sensor and, and drop the quarter exactly on our sensor point. This is something that I disclaimer, do not actually do this. You are going to break your camera and damage your sensor. But hypothetically, if we print a 16 by 20 print out of this image of the quarter laying on our sensor, we're gonna get an image here in true macro of a quarter that is 16 inches in diameter. It's a true representation of what that would look like if we place it on the sensor. The image here on the middle, is a one to two macro or 50% life size. That is that same quarter, but now in that 16 by 20 print, it is eight inches in diameter. It's half of its life size representation if you were to place it on the sensor. Lastly, on the far left, yes, <laughs> um, that's close-up photography. And close-up photography is technically any lens that can give you a representation of 25% of its life size or one to four. Um, this same 16 by 20 print would have a quarter of four inches in diameter on that print. Think about the world in a four by six inch section. So um, 
versus a one by one inch section, just a visual area of the kind of stuff that you're looking for. For me, you know, speaking a little bit more um, artistically about it, you know, what is close up photography for me? It is the art of highlighting smaller subjects. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to happen to find something interesting that is small. No, oh, hearing a little bit of something in the background there. So in close up photography, it really any zoom lens can give for little things. Stores or the flea markets could be butterflies on flowers. Here, you know, using more of a wider angle lens to give me more of an environmental close up shot. Um, wide angles have this inherent ability to just let in the whole world in at once. So, you know, getting really close to that butterfly and that flower, this is a great close up photograph of a butterfly land on a flower. Here's another example. Again, close up photography, finding things that are small that you find interesting. Uh, this is a portion of the Portland Airport, at least it was a couple months ago when I was there last. Um, they had this art installation of acrylic cutout pieces that were all stacked and layered inside of this huge acrylic box. So there was like a farmer's market and a little barn with animals. And this is like a, like a park, uh, park scene with the, with the tire swing and the chairs there. And it just, it just caught me as creative and interesting. And so I spent a good amount of time, because I had time before my flight, picking out these little vignettes, picking out these little sections that I found interesting. Now, like I mentioned, zoom lenses have an inherent ability to give you close-up photography. Um, but there's a common misconception here in the fact that you have to, you don't have to be close to your subject to get close-up details with your zoom lens. You know, how many times have you taken your lens and your camera and you found something really interesting and then you like literally try to get really, really close to it and your camera can't find focus. It just keeps searching in and out. That is because you are physically too close to your subject. Um, every lens has a minimum focusing distance and it's different for every manufacturer, it's different on every lens. But that means that if you get within that minimum focusing distance, you're closer than that lens knows how to focus and it won't find focus, you won't get a clear image. We measure the minimum focusing distance from the sensor plane. So you see that little icon in the center with a circle with a line through it. Look for that on your camera. It's generally up by the viewfinder somewhere. And that is the sensor plane. That is where we measure from. So if it says minimum focusing distance is 20 inches, it's not 20 inches from the end of the lens. It's 20 inches from that sensor plane on your camera. Okay, next step. When we wanna do close-up photography with a zoom lens, the, the best technique here is to zoom your lens all the way out. I use the 18 to 400 here as a really great example for that. Minimum focusing distance here is 20 inches from the sensor. So I'm about 20 inches from my eye at 400 millimeter. And I'm gonna get a close up photograph. I'm gonna get about a four by six image. One to four representation. This, this lens and these zoom lenses work really great for flowers and for like rusty hinges, um, details on classic car emblems and things like that. You know, just little things that you find interesting when you're out and about or around your house. The key differentiation here, when we talk about macro photography as a whole in comparison to close up, macro photography is a completely different way of thinking. And it's sometimes hard to get into this mindset. Macro photography, it's about what you find interesting about the subject you're photographing. It has little to do with what the subject actually is. So the butterflies in the photographs before, what do we find interesting about the butterflies? For me, it's their wings most of the time. It's going to be the, the subtle repeating shapes and lines, um, just the graphic aspect of, of what makes up their texture and their color. So this is a macro photograph versus the previous close-up photograph. I also take that quarter from that previous example. And now I find interesting the graphic uh, engravings that are on the back of all these customized quarters for the states did a whole series with these and I've got examples with shooting metal and jewelry at the end of this presentation. But, you know, again, just think about that mindset. Think about, okay, I found my subject. I found something I really like, but what do I like about it? How can I highlight that in a photograph? How can I make that a macro image? 
Okay. Next couple of slides, again, like I said, are on the 90 millimeter. Um, this is a lens that I take out with me pretty much every time I'm, I'm out because I, again, I'm a macro photographer. I look for little things. Um, you can also use this as a portrait lens. We like to make and mention also like macro lenses have a flat field of view. So when we have a, a field of view for a normal lens, it's generally curved. Um, it's gonna be C-shaped just like this. Similarly, if we're doing like a big group photograph, they're gonna be in like a semicircle. That is because the depth of field for, for normal lenses, non-macro lenses is C-shaped. Macro lenses are flat, completely linear. So when we do uh, portrait sessions with a macro lens, it is really easy to get a great shallow depth of field, the sharp focus, um, just a really nice even sweep from front to back. And you can use like brick walls or chain link fences or just, you know, really interesting walls as your backdrop. Some of the technology that it has, um, just again to clarify so you guys know what this lens can offer for you. Um, for speed and performance, we have two big features here. We have the, uh, the VC technology. This is a uh, vibration compensation. It's an image stabilization technology that Tamron has in most of their lenses. And in the 90 specifically, it's a four axis stabilization system. So it's like a gimbal head that's built into your camera. You can go X, Y, and Z, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, and pitch and yaw. Really gives you great stabilization, especially in slower shutter speeds when you have to handhold your work. The second switch in the middle there, the USD autofocusing motor. Uh, this is the, the fastest, the most robust, but the quietest autofocusing motor that Tamron has in their tool bag. And we use the USD motor here specifically because the field of view, the area of options for focus with the 90 millimeter lens goes from 11 inches to infinity. And when we have such a wide area to try to find our focus in, you need a motor that's going to be able to quickly snap from close to far without um, a lot of legs so that you don't get frustrated as a photographer. Here's a great example of that stabilization in play. Um, I like to highlight this image because I guarantee this is not sharp. This is a situation that I find myself in often. Uh, we are at an eighth of a second in a railroad museum. This one here is in St. Paul here. Um, in my hometown of Minneapolis, we've got a gorgeous model train museum uh, right across the, the river there in St. Paul. And the problem with these places, it's great for practice, it's great to find subject matter, but there's not a lot of good light. We're in a warehouse with uh, fluorescent lighting way above our heads. We can't bring tripods in because again, this is, this is a train museum. There's, there's so much stuff packed in this place that it's really not advantageous to bring a tripod along. And I want, um, you know, a relatively clean picture. So my ISO is going to be around 400 or 500. I'm not going to crank it up too high. My aperture is going to be 2.8. So I can let in as much of that little light as I can. Shutter speeds end up being really, really slow. Turning up my stabilization. So turning that on, you can now see the difference, obviously, that this, uh, this is something that will now put you in situations that generally you wouldn't be able to photograph in. Yes, David, I will elaborate on that a little bit. David asks, macro lenses are flat versus curved, and what does that mean? So here's another great example of those two working together. Field of view is, is basically the area of a photograph. Or So you, when we talk about depth of field, let me start that over for a second. When we talk about general depth of field of a photograph, we talk about um, you know, how much of that photograph or what plane is that photograph in focus on. Um, a non-macro lens, so anything that isn't like the 90 millimeter macro or the 100 millimeter macro, the 105, the 60, you know, like a true macro lens, it's going to have a C-shaped or a curved field of view. So my sharpness is going to go from here and it's going to travel in that C-shape around. A macro lens, and this is a great example of that, has a completely linear or flat field of view. So here, that blade of glass that blade of grass is pretty much parallel with my sensor, so it's easy to keep that in focus. Um, as soon as I start pivoting away from my sensor plane, it's going to be harder to keep all of this in focus because, again, my field of view is completely linear. It's completely parallel to my sensor. I hope that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you, David. 
Um, this is that USD and the VC playing together. So again, we have speed and performance here. Um, I've got a butterfly in a conservatory, so there's lots of them running around. It's in the middle of the day, so they're really active. Um, if you have something like this in your own hometown or you do visit a, a butterfly conservatory or a greenhouse or something like that, go on colder days. And I know out in the Bay Area, this is easier to do uh, than like in LA or something like that. Um, also go early in the morning or later in the evening. They're not gonna be as active. They're gonna sit and, and, and pose for you a little bit longer. Um, here, treat this like a sports photograph. Speak, treat this like uh, birds in flight. So I'm gonna do a center weighted focusing point in multi-burst mode, so ch -ch -ch -ch, rapid fire. Um, and then honestly, sometimes if there's a lot of wind and my subject is literally swaying back and forth, I'm also gonna rock ever so slightly back and forth, hoping and, and trying to run the probability in my favor that this photograph is going to be exactly sharp where I want it to be. This is one out of like 40 pictures that I took and I just erased the rest of them, but I like it a lot. It's a piano keys butterfly. He is about an inch tall, teeny tiny. Now we talk about durability in the second section of the 90 millimeter. Um, just letting you know that there are many lenses that are weather resistant out there. Um, weather resistant lenses, you'll see on the back end cap that there's a little bit of rubber there. That's a good indicator that your lens has some moisture resistancy to it. The 90 specifically is moisture proof. So it's dust proof, waterproof, oil proof. It is not submersible, but it's definitely gonna handle fog and rain and snow and dust and all of those things that you generally would wanna go photograph in. This is also a good nod for uh, rain sleeves. So if you, again, have a, you know, a $10 budget and you wanna go pick up some rain sleeves, it's better than a plastic bag and a rubber band. And I have lots of them tucked in my glove box and my camera bags and things like that. Cause you know, that is a great, just extra, extra case situation if it starts downpouring or if you find yourself in a situation where you don't feel comfortable anymore. But the lenses here is very durable. Um, on the front, you'll see a fluorine coating and an E-band coating. Fluorine coating is gonna be an anti-dust, anti-water, anti-oil, again, keeping it cleaner for you so that your images are clearer overall. And then the E-band coating is for anti-glare, anti-ghosting. It's a clarity coating edge to edge. This comes into play when we're shooting directly into the sunlight. Here, I've got some backlit grass. Um, after the rain, I was driving down the road, saw these gorgeous little, like, literally the water droplets were lighting up as I was driving along, and it looked like sparkle paper as I was driving. So I had to stop, I had to pull over safely, and um, I sat in the ditch for about 30 minutes photographing this stuff. And it is just fascinating when you get down and look at the little details, like how subtle and how minimalistic this is, and just gorgeous. You know, you see all the different striations in the grass, um, if you want to get a photograph like this and you haven't mowed your lawn for three or four weeks, go take a look at, your, at the grass in your backyard and grab a spritzer bottle. Just make your own drop list. That works too. The fluorine coating, the durability of this lens, this is going to also keep in play this time of year with pollen. You know, we've got a lot of pollen running around and if you're outside for more than 30 minutes, an hour sometimes, I will find little yellow dust particles on my bag and on my gear. And now it is, it is perfectly fine. You know, again, this is a lens that you can take with you no matter where you want to go find, find inspiration. Last little bit, I promise the last bit of technology on this lens specifically. Uh, this is actually the number one question. What does this, this, this little switch do on the side? Why is it important? Uh, this is an electronic distance limiter switch. Basically what we're doing is in very low contrast situations. Again, our lens is trying to find focus from 11 inches to infinity. So when we don't have contrast, we have nothing that our lens can, can grab onto for focus. And this distance limiter switch is going to help our lens know where to look. The full position, which I leave it in 99% of the time, I'll only really adjust this if I realize my lens is having issues. Um, it's going to you know, look at the whole range. The middle one is going to be for portraiture. So it's going to look only a foot and a half out to infinity. And then the bottom position there is only for macro. It's only going to look from 11 inches to a foot and a half. That's it. That's what it's going to focus on. If you happen to have the tap-in console at home, it's not just for firmware adjustments and updates. Uh, for the 90 millimeter specifically, you can actually customize this electronic distance limiter switch to however you like to photograph. 
Um, I open up that bottom position a little bit. So I go from uh, 11 inches to about two feet because that's where I find my subject matter is. And then that infinity switch in the middle, I'll go from um, three, four feet to infinity because I know in those situations I'm doing portraiture and my subject's going to be well beyond macro range. All right, enough about that. Let's get into the technique, the hands-on stuff. That's why we're all here, right? Macro at home. Um, this section I put together, again, because I wanted to explain how I approach my imagery, how I approach my photography, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look on um, how this mind works when I'm photographing macro. Um, so the, the first goal, again, find something you wanna photograph, find inspiration, find an object that you find interesting. And then we gotta look at the light. In this situation, I've got a one single light source. Uh, in this case, it's an LED light. And there are many different LED lights out there. I know Action Camera has some. Um, I like smaller ones. So four by six, five by seven, six by nine is about the biggest one I'll have. Um, sometimes I'll use an LED ring light so I can put it in the front of my camera when I'm photographing insects or bugs or something like that. Um, in this case, imagine that it's either an LED light or an open window or harsh midday light, something like that. You've just got a single strong light source. Um, we've also got a reflector. So this five in one reflector that you see down there has gold and silver for warmer or cooler light reflection coming back on the other side. It's got a white reflector for softer light reflection. And then it's got a diffuser to help just soften that light overall. This will change the look of your photograph. In the first one, this is our natural light. So I've got that single light source, I've got a very harsh contrast left to right, lots of great deep shadows, lots of drama. You'll notice that my background here, even though it's a white wall, is black, it is dark. You know, in this situation, imagine your subject is in the sun and the background is in the shade. So the exposure differences there are too far apart and it can't find a, you know, a good even exposure on both. I want to fill in those shadows a little bit so that my first option is to use uh, the reflector. Here I use the silver reflector. And if you imagine that, you know, my sunlight's coming up from here, I'm literally going to take my reflection and capture that light and bounce it back into the shadow areas. Now, if you don't have a five in one reflector kit, they are pretty inexpensive, but you can use um, aluminum foil on cardboard. You can use a mirror. There's lots of different things. The idea with the reflector, again, is to take your sunlight, capture it, and bounce it back into your shadows to help even out that exposure. Still love the drama here with the black background because, again, my background is still in the shade, not in the sunlight. Second example here is just a standard diffusion. So in the same situation, I've got my light source. It's over here. And then my diffuser is a semi-transparent fabric that I'm gonna put in between my subject and my light source to give me a nice soft light overall. My background is now lighter because we've made those exposures closer and in value. And, and this is also a good photograph, but it's less contrasty, it's softer, it's a more natural look, it's a completely different feel. Which one do you prefer? So let's consider this idea in our backyard. Again, this is a lot of my subject matter. This is a lot of uh, the type of photographs that I do because the great thing about macro photography is you can photograph at any time of day. Doesn't matter that you are up at 4 a.m. before the sun comes up to find a special location right before the sunrise. You don't have to stay up well past the moon set so you can photograph the Milky Way. Like this is two o'clock in the afternoon. This is harsh midday light and we can work with this. It's very accessible, it's, it's very approachable for, for a photographer. So number one, I found my subject. Um, this is one of the California poppies out by San Diego. Being from Minnesota, I personally have no idea that your poppies were orange. I've only ever seen red ones in my life, so this was a really nice day for me. And it was a part of the Super Bloom a couple of years ago, so um, what a treat, what a beautiful area that you guys have out there. Now, now that I have my subject, I identify the light. You know, that first photograph was really not visually appealing. It was so contrasty back and forth. Um, and I chose to just use the diffuser here to soften that light and to give me an even exposure all around. If you don't have a diffuser with you, I've used pillowcases, I've used sheets. Um, I've literally also used myself because again, we're dealing with areas that are four by six in, in, in size. So you, your shadow, can create a nice even exposure for your subject if you just stand in the way of your light source and provide that shade for your subject. 
Last thing, what I'll do, and the big thing with flowers is you have to find a good composition. You have to identify, you know, what, what do you like about this flower? How does it identify itself? How can you make your image of this specific flower different from all the other ones that you've seen before? Um, in this case, this was my favorite composition out of that specific flower that I found. Um, I love the leading lines of the stem coming up and more of the side profile. And then you could tell all the repeating shapes and the, and the other poppies diffused in the background. Here's another one. This is an orchid, but again, it's less about the fact that it's an orchid and it's more about what do I find interesting about this flower that I'm photographing. And most of the time, if you look at flower photographs, it's gonna be about the middle bits. Um, the stamen, the pollen, things like that. That's going to be kind of like the eyes of a flower in a photograph. And for me, this was in a, this was in a garden and it, the background really wasn't doing anything for me. I really wanted to focus and simplify this scene. And so I literally just got closer and used the flower itself as the background. Wonderfully soft color gradations from the pinks to the greens. Um, you have that just little sharp bit in the middle kind of coming up like an umbrella. I'm not a gardener by any means, so I don't really know what most of this stuff is technically, but I find them pretty and I photograph them often. Here's another one. Photographed this one of the first couple of weeks that we were home, so the middle of March when we were off the road. This is the first bloom on one of my house plants. And it was just looking out the office window, trying to get, gather some early morning light. And I just, it, it caught me the semi-transparency and the color coming through the petals. That was the first inspiration. And I started exploring this scene a little bit more and realized that the one little leaf that was hanging out on this one little flower was shaped like a heart. And that made me smile. So I then made this my, my main image. This was the one that I really took home and um, really took to heart. Okay, now we're going to talk about backgrounds a little bit. Um, when we, so we have our subject, we have our lighting. The last little bit in the macro triangle is going to be your backgrounds. Is my background helping or hurting my subject? How can I change it? Can I change it? Um, can I, you know, cut little leaves that are distracting from the background? Do I have to move? Like, good backgrounds can make or break an image, for sure. And this is a great example of that. So this photograph is a simple photograph of um, one of my spaghetti squash buds kind of coming up from, from the table. This was before we transplanted everything outside into the garden. And I found inspiration here with all the little fuzzy bits that were coming off the leaves and the stem and stuff. They were just so fun and different. And I'd never noticed that before. So the setup is very simple. You'll see the little window there as that's my setup. Same LED light, one light source, found the subject, found the composition, got the light dialed in, hated the background. This is the, the, the diffused view out my window of my deck and it just, it wasn't doing anything for this photograph. And thankfully, again, because macro subjects are so small, I've got lots of little bits of cardstock and fabric and, and you could find simplified things to make a better background. It's very easy. In this first one, all I did was I found a piece of styrofoam that was from a post, um, a package that I got in the mail the day before. Little piece of styrofoam, I just dropped it in the background. Um, and now I've got an image that is much better. Uh, the color has gotten more vibrant. The distractions have gone away. This looks very commercial shot to me. And it was literally in front of a window with one LED light on my kitchen table. Don't need a studio to set this stuff up. You just need to know how to think about it. So then I started playing around a little bit. What else can I use? Uh, this gray backdrop, a little bit softer, a little bit more natural look. Um, this is a gray knit stocking cap that was put around a roll of paper towels. You'd never know that unless I told you, because again, we're dealing with such a small space. Lastly, a little bit of remnant fabric that I had. Love the pattern, love the reds and the greens playing off each other. So um, again, I just propped that up over that paper towel roll and um, just put it in the background. Change the scene, but same subject, same lighting setup, three completely different looks. We can take this idea outside as well. If you have a garden or if you're in an area where there's just a lot of blooms and there's so much confusion and there's so much distractions going on in your background, um, carry some cardstock with you. Again, little six by six sheets is all you need. 
Um, I've even used Pantone color examples from the hardware store, like paint samples. I've gone to the hobby store and gotten like glitter paper makes a really great, interesting background with all the specular highlights. Uh, this is wonderfully vivid green and I thought it made a good contrast to this super vivid magenta red um, photograph. I have no idea what kind of flower this is, but I absolutely loved the spiky bits there coming up at a diagonal line. Kind of reminds me of like an 80s punk rock painting of some sort. Flowers are neat. The last little bit we get into is um, jewelry. So I wanted to definitely highlight jewelry in the fact that it is a very difficult subject to photograph. And, or, you know, people think it's more difficult than it actually is. These, these are the kind of the tips that I like to give people. I use a polarizing filter a lot with macro photography, specifically for jewelry or shiny subjects. I also will use them outside if I remember to bring it with me because a polarizer, especially in the harsh midday light, will help cut down reflections of, on foliage and leaves and help give you more vibrant, vivid color. Sometimes I'll come home and I'll actually have too much saturation in my flowers, so I'll have to dial it back a little bit. Uh, it's amazing what a little bit of polarization can do. I'm also going to diffuse the light all the time. You know, the softer the light that you have, the, the less reflections, uh, the less hot spots you have to deal with. And if you have a couple that happen to linger that you can't figure out where they're coming from, you know, we see hot spots a lot with overhead lights, with um, like can lights or fluorescent lights or like a window that's coming in at a weird angle. If you can't figure out where they're coming from, use a blackboard. A blackboard is literally like a little sheet of black foam core and it's on a dowel. So it's like a little, little puppet that you kind of move around your subject and figure out exactly where that hot spot is coming from so you can cut it out so you don't have to clone it and heal it after the fact. Get it all done in camera. I've even in a pinch, you know, stapled some black card stock onto a pencil, something that I can have. And I'll have like long skinny ones, I'll have circle shaped ones. Um, they're pretty small, you know, two inches by four inches or, you know, three inch square, something like that. It's just a little piece. The setup for this image is not that technical at all. Again, you don't need a studio to do professional corporate looking catalog shoots. Um, this one was, I took the lens hood of my 90 millimeter, flipped it upside down. I balled up an ankle sock in there so I have a, like a, a base to put my watch on. And then I took a cardboard box with a piece of velvet over it. So black velvet, velour, felt, these are great backdrop fabrics because they don't reflect a lot of light. I pinned it up so it kind of swept over this little lens hood thing that I have. And then I placed the pocket watch in it and photographed it. If you're dealing with something inside of a window, so you know, you're, you're walking around the street, you find a really interesting piece at a jewelry store or an antique store, something like that. The trick here is to put your lens right on top of that window. Take your lens hood off. Definitely don't force it, don't damage your camera at all, but you know, if you can get your lens directly on top of that glass at the same angle, uh, we're gonna cut out reflections of ourselves, the photographers. We're gonna cut out reflections of streets that are across the street or uh, lights, street lights that are across the street or cars that are driving by, something like that. Um, having that angle is, is a little trick that we like to use. So again, we don't have to do a lot of post-production to our photographs. One more in the metal section. Uh, this is considered flat lay macro or found macro. Like I mentioned, I frequent antique stores. I frequent hobby shops. Uh, flea markets, garage sales, things like that. Like I am always drawn to teeny tiny little things that, that are weird, that are unique, that are intricate and detailed. And um, for me, when I need a little bit of time to just kind of like unwind and, and figure things out, I'll grab a big pile of stuff and I'll just sit and play and layer it and create these little vignettes. In this situation, I'm using my tripod like I did with the watch and my camera's facing straight down on a tabletop. And then you kind of pull out all of these things. And I have it again on that black felt as my backdrop. And you just start placing stuff, you know, use your live view, uh, work your scene, move the angles ever so slightly, you know, to visually give you leading lines to fill up the entire frame. Where do I want those words to fall? You know, I like the little triangle that I have visually that brings your eye around the frame from journey to life to genuine things like that. Um, the tricky thing with metal also, you know, metal is a slippery subject. Anytime you're working with marbles or 
keys or watch gears or something like that. Um, I like to use a little bit of double stick tape or a little bit of rubber cement. And if it gets too sticky, I'll literally just, you know, tap it on my shirt to fuzz it up a little bit. And then you can start layering things. They won't slip around on you. Um, if you accidentally bump the table or if you've got a big dog that runs by or something, you're not, all of your hard work is not going to get undone in an instant because the thing's shake and everything kind of falls apart. A little bit of double stick tape, tip of the day. The last section before we really get into the customized conversation is just a little bit of inspiration to walk around your house and find things that you generally find mundane and how can we highlight them? How can we make macro subjects out of things that you walk by all, all the time in your own home? Because this is where we are now. We are in our houses. We are finding new inspiration with things that we maybe forgotten about, cleaning old closets out and all this stuff. Uh, this first image, this, these are beautifully patinaed hoses that are running off of my lawn, uh, my lawn mower. It's in the garage. Um, I'm very gravitated towards color, especially contrasting colors, reds and greens, blues and yellows, things like that. So that caught my eye first. And then just the, the fact that this brass is so old and, and patinaed and oxidized, and then you've got the rubber with all the crackling and things like that. Uh, this is a lawnmower. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Second one, uh, these are Edison bulbs that are hanging above my kitchen island. And the trick with shooting light bulbs and, and different um, fixtures like this, I love Edison bulbs because their filaments just go up and down and there's a lot of great lines in there. Uh, they have to be on maybe 10 or 15%. They can't be on full blast. You won't get the detail. Um, the exposure is going to be really harsh and contrasting. So just turn them on a little bit if they're on a dimmer. And then in this situation, 2.8, uh, fifteenth of a second, and I'm actually standing on my counter handheld trying to photograph this thing. Same technique with the butterflies. Rapid fire mode, center weighted focus, a little bit of luck. And I'm really happy about how this one turned out too. If I have anybody who likes to cook, or now, you know, recently consider themselves a cook, um, consider your, your ingredients. Consider your fridge as a, as a treasure trove of macro photograph opportunities. Uh, here is a simple clove of garlic on a nice dark wood cutting board. Reminds me of an oil painting a little bit. I've also found backlighting oranges or cut up fruit is a really great way to find macro photograph. Vegetables are really fun. Go exploring. Lastly, uh, this is a cassette tape. I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with, with uh, what cassette tapes are. Um, for me, I love the magnetic ribbon. That's what caught my eye and just, just the spacing and, and the energy that was there. Uh, the first couple images, of course, was just that little window, really simplifying to just what that magnetic ribbon was. But I found that I lost a lot of content of exactly what this was. So I pulled back a little bit and included just a little bit of a nod of the, the sprocket there and a little bit of artwork that's coming up the side to create something that has um, some contrast and some graphic detail. All right, how was that? Not too bad, huh? I hope everybody got something out of it. And again, I wanted to give us some, some extra time to really delve into questions that you might have. So use the chat window. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to know. I, I would like to just start off by saying I've never seen the cassette tape photo before. I don't know if that's new <laughs> and I absolutely love it. Uh, you, you do have the, I think one of the most inspiration or inspiring things about your uh, presentations, because um, I've, you know, I, I get to see it fairly often. Uh, a couple of times now. Yeah, is, is uh, yeah, how inspiring it is or, or kind of getting people to um, look at, uh, you know, look at those, the, the, the little details that, that we always, like you said in the presentation, that we always just kind of take for granted and the things you don't really notice. Um, and then like seeing what you've done with those details that you've noticed and the ways in which you've photographed them. Um, and then the just the like, incredible images that you can get out of it, you know, is, is uh, I think uh, every one of us is probably inspired to some point that, you know, we want to start looking around us at all, at all the little, yeah. little details and, and, you know, seeing what we can come up with. So. That's great. That's, that's I did. definitely the main idea. And, you know, don't ever overthink it, you know, get inspired and figure out how can I make that happen? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that maybe we could, um, you covered this, um, 
kind of over a broad uh, 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 period of time, but maybe we could talk a little bit uh, again about the difference between, um, you know, what people would understand macro, a macro lens, you know, a true macro lens, uh, and then shooting some of like what the, you could look close up photography, because, you know, most of the lenses in the Tamron line online um, uh, have that one to four uh, or close up kind of macro feature. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have a, a macro one-to-one -one macro lens to be able to get a lot of the shots um, that you had. And uh, I was glad to see that you actually had put the lenses that you were using on there so that folks could see like, you know, this was, this was an all-in-one lens, you know, or this mm -hmm. was, you know, a different lens, not necessarily the 90 macro. Um, so yeah, if you could uh, just touch again briefly on the difference between macro versus uh, close-up Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of how to, you know, what the difference is and um, if there's any uh, specific reason that, you know, somebody would necessarily have to have uh, a macro lens versus, you know, a lens that's yeah, just yeah, been yeah. close up. Mm -hmm. that, that is a beautiful topic we can talk about more. And it's a question that I used to get behind the counter. So I come from retail. I used to manage a retail store here in Minnesota. And so one of the best parts of my job is figuring out what you're trying to ask based on the words you're trying to use. Uh, and it's a fun game. When I have, um, like if, I, if a customer comes up and say, I want to get closer to something, the first thing is, okay, do you want to get closer to things that are small? Or do you want to get closer to things that are really, really far away? If, if something is 100 or 200 yards off, this is a completely different conversation about telephoto lenses and getting close in a different definition. But when we want to get closer to things in a macro sense, the next question I always ask is how small is the subject you want to photograph? Because honestly, 99% of the time, customers or photographers, they want to photograph something that is maybe four by six area in size or three and a half by five. And a lens that has close-up capability can get you that for sure. Um, we are biased here to Tamron here in Tamron land because you know that is who we work for. And a great advantage of that brand is that all of our zoom lenses have great close-up capability. But I encourage you to try this technique with the lenses that you have because this is a technology that is not specific to our lenses only. Um, basically the only reason, trying to grab the right one, here we go. We'll do this one. Um, the biggest reason that I would go specifically with a 90 macro or a specific one-to-one -one macro lens is if my subject is going to be an inch by an inch. Like if I'm looking at a teeny tiny subject often and extension tubes can't get me there, and I'll talk about that more, or like close-up filters can't get me there, then you need a specific macro lens to get the best result. Um, I'll also suggest the 90 for someone who mainly does portraiture, but wants to get into macro photography because that 90 millimeter, that focal range is very popular in portrait photography. So you have a lens that does double duty. With a zoom lens, so assuming that I want to do close up stuff, I want to photograph three and a half by five inch areas, um, and I have a zoom lens, all I need to do is zoom the lens all the way out. This is, this is trick number one. Having it all the way out to its furthest telephoto is going to give you the magnification within its minimum focusing distance. Um, and then I back up. So like um, this isn't the 18 to 400, but that's, that's the spec that I'm remembering right now. It's 20 inches from the sensor. So if, if I'm the sensor here at 20 inches, my focus point, my minimum focus point is here. This is as absolutely as close as I can get to my subject. And to get the most magnification, again, I'm not going to shoot it at 18. I'm going to shoot it at 400. I'm going to get that magnification within that range. Did that answer the question? That's how you do it. <laughs> I lost track. I went off on a tangent. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just you we wanted to uh, give folks the, the idea of, you know, the difference between what they would get if they were to photograph the same subject with a one-to-one -one yeah. macro versus photographing them with a, you know, a, a, you know, a the, zoom just lens. say one of the one of our lenses, a zoom lens that has the the one to four close focus. You um, can physically get closer and you can get better magnification with. Thank you, with a um, with a specific macro lens. But again, most of the time people are just going after close-up photography, mm -hmm. and then we can start the conversation of okay, what else do you physically photograph? 
Um, this is a great action camera sort of conversation that you can have with them. Because if you're mostly a wildlife photographer, but you want to get into macro, I might not suggest the 90. I would suggest the 2.5 tele or the 2x teleconverter that we make. Because if you put the 2x teleconverter on our 150 to 600, which is great for wildlife, I can get a one to two macro representation. And um, at about three feet, that's its minimum focusing distance at that point, I can do uh, bees, I can do spiders, I can do like scary things that I don't want to get close to and get some really nice uh, one inch, two inch ratio stuff with that. I, I, I don't think I even knew that. Um, yeah. Always learning something. Uh, uh, and then since uh, so we're open up for questions, everybody with questions, uh, looks like Jillian, like some of them have uh, uh, sent you their questions directly. But uh, if you want to put it in the chat window, you know, any one of us, uh, we can answer those questions. Uh, I did want to take a, uh, a second here too to give um, Jillian the floor on another subject. Um, Jillian wears several hats uh, in the land of Tamron. Um, and one of them is uh, the organizer uh, or head of the Tamron EDU um, program, which is uh, essentially, um, you know, Tamron discounts and perks for students. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of folks are not aware um, that, uh, that we have a student program. Uh, so I was, uh, had asked Jillian ahead of time uh, if she would um, just kind of give a, a quick piece on, you know, what is available. Um, if you yourself are not a student, then maybe, you know, you know someone who is. Um, so, um, yeah, let me turn it back over to you for that one, Jillian, if you want to give us a quick uh, plug for the EDU program. I'm happy to. Thank you for the opportunity, Ben. Um, yeah, like he said, I am the school market liaison as well for Tamron. And basically what that means is anything that is college or university level student based. Um, if they have questions, if they need help, if they need specialized content, they get to funnel to me, which is really fun. Because um, when I was a student, when I was going to school, I never really took any mention to third party. Like I didn't know what it was and my students or my, my teachers weren't really actively educating me on anything other than, you know, you shoot Canon glass with Canon cameras and Nikon glass with Nikon cameras. And um, the fact now that we work for a company that is so high quality and is so third party, um, we make lenses for all cameras. And the student program started up again in 2017. And up until this month, there has been specific requirements as far as, you know, you needed to be a student at university or college level and you needed to be in a photo major or a communications major, a video major, multimedia, something like that. Um, this May, literally like 12 days ago, we revamped the program and worked really hard. So now there is a set educational student price and it is currently ongoing through September and it is open and available to any college level student at an accredited university. We need a valid student ID and we need um, you know, a copy of your receipt. We're still gonna make purchases at our local dealers nationwide, and it's a mail-in rebate that you can get back on your lens purchase. Um, if you need more information on it, so um, my contact here on, on Instagram and Facebook is here, Bell Tamron USA, but for the specific school site, you go to Tamron EDU. So it's Tamron backslash, or Tamron-USA.com backslash Tamron EDU. That'll get you all the content there. Well, and we can also, um, uh, Chris, I'll make sure that you have um, the, uh, those materials, that information you can include. Um, we usually we do, uh, uh, with action, uh, a follow-up to everybody. Um, because you uh, tuned into this webinar, we have uh, bonus rebate opportunities, uh, $25 to $50 in bonus rebates. Um, that you can get through action camera specifically by you know calling in your order um you could uh even stop in the store like we said earlier they are open again um and that is uh, bonus rebates uh in addition to um the national rebates that are going on right now so um you know where well, national rebates can be upwards of 100 to you know sometimes 200 dollars on certain lenses so you could be looking at some very significant uh sig significant savings um, uh, on uh, you know, some Tamron lenses in the line. So um, we can, uh, we'll put all of that uh, together in a nice little follow-up email or package 
some kind uh and and chris can get that out to everybody um so if uh and, and then of course you know any questions um you know chris and action camera uh would also be um mm -hmm. able to help with as well definitely yeah make sure and give us a call or come into the store we can help with any of that and we can always get in touch with ben or jillian if we need to get any questions through to, to you guys as well so um we had a couple more questions in chat but that i also was going to say um if people wanted to be able to, if you're okay with this, one on one at a time, we can unmute people for questions as well. I noticed that Clara had her hand up. So if people use the participant section, you can actually raise hand. It will put you at the top. We can see you. Um, do you guys want to do that? You want me to unmute her and she can ask a question real quick? Sure. Okay, Clara, yeah. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, so you're going to be live here right now. Can okay. you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to ask the questions. Actually, um, I'm really interested in macro photography, but I'm absolutely just starting. Um, but um, I was wondering, uh, you know, the macro uh, photography is a very shallow field. Have you tried that uh, stack focusing or focusing stacking uh, procedures? You know, would it make that uh, shallow focusing a little bit deeper and then everything is a little bit more focusing that is that is a great question clara and something that always also comes up in every class that i teach um, this is a technique called focus stacking and yeah. if you want to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if you want to know specifically more about how to do it there are um, there's so many online resources as far as from youtube videos to different softwares that you can use um, for me personally i used to do it a lot and specifically, so what focus stacking is, is you're going to take an image again, because we are so small in our subject matter, our depth of field, even at F32 is very small. Um, this, let me find the picture again. This orchid that I photographed, this was at F16, something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if I wanted to get absolutely everything sharp from the stamen to the pollen to the back of the flower, um, I'm going to need something more than F32 that my lens will give me. And um, there's two ways to do that. Here, if I did use focus stacking, I would take many photographs from the front focus all the way to the background focus. And then I would use a software to collaborate them together, kind of like HDR in the, same, in the same technique, only we're dealing with focus points instead of dynamic range. Um, like I said, there's many, many of them out there. A very common one is um, Helicon Focus. It's a paid program, but it's pretty inexpensive. That's the one that I use. Um, you can literally do an internet search for top 10 free focus stacking programs, and there's a lot of opportunities there too. Now, my question actually to you, have you tried that and did you like the process? Oh, yes. What's the outcome of it? Um, I personally, my style, I don't get into focus stacking too terribly much. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, macro photography is always about simplifying and finding a specific mm -hmm. moment that I find to be my subject. Mm -hmm. And when we have a more shallow depth of field like this in some of my other photographs, it helps with the dimension of the photograph. It helps give it depth and life. Um, and it really helps my one subject stand out. Um, I find that if I have too much of a um, depth of field, so if I get everything sharp, it just gets flat and I, and I lose my subject matter gets very graphic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank but you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. The only time I would ever use focus stacking or something like this is like if I'm doing a product shoot with like rings or jewelry. Um, there is a great technique in the video um, on the website, the, the homeschool section from my five at five macro workshop. At the end, I do extension tubes and teleconverters on the 150 to 600. And I have a focus area of about four inches. I'm doing game pizzas. And currently, that's my that's my version of focus stacking because I can photograph at f eighty one and get four inches of focus and really compress and stack all my elements together. Wow, it's fun. That's cool. <laughs> and I get bored, so you know what else can I do? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, and, and to uh, give that a quick plug again, um, you know, the uh, Chris had shared that link for us earlier. Um, the 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 video material uh, webinar uh, material that uh, our tech reps have been working on um hey there we go um is really really incredible stuff uh and i you know personally will it, it you know it's great to sit down for your morning coffee uh or to have your lunch 
uh, while watching these videos. I don't think any of them is more than you know, 40 minutes or so. Um, oh no, five uh, to so 20. Maybe, yeah, 20. So maybe 20 to 40 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're lots of fun. They're very informative, all kinds of subjects. Um, definitely uh, go check those out. And then, uh, you know, on Facebook um, uh, as well, uh, Tamron keeps, uh, you know, generating new um, material and, and things to keep us all busy and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, inspired while we are uh, still in our homes and, and, and buckling down. So yeah, are there any question. other questions? Uh, we did have Is a few more questions in out? chat. Go ahead. Um, Brian asked, do you recommend single point focus when shooting subjects that are not moving? 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This comes down to technique. Uh, personally, I, I, I like to move my focus point around. So I'm giving, I'm giving my camera less options to find focus on. I wanna tell them, I'm, I want you to look specifically on that section of that flower or specifically on that head of that butterfly. Yeah, sometimes. Now, if, if they aren't moving, if they aren't moving, yeah, you can, you can use the left, the right point, something like that. But if they are moving, I always crop for composition after the fact. Cool. All right, and then we had a question from Mike. Uh, Jillian, do you ever use speed lights or flash for lighting? And if so, do you have any tips? Most of my work is with natural light or LEDs, specifically because, um, you know, I like to see what the image is going to be before I photograph it, you know, while I'm creating this moment. Um, speed light photography, it all comes down to, you do get a little bit better crispness and clarity. It looks a little more commercial with, with, with um, speed lights. Most commonly in macro photography, you're going to find a ring light. This is a, this is a donut shaped light that goes right over the front of your lens. And this is used very often in um, insect work. Um, and if you're going to do this, you know, you, you either need to go to a space where there's a lot of insects flying around or you need to bait them a little bit. So I photographed dragonflies a while back where I had a little bit of sugar water in a dish and I waited for them to come take a drink basically. It's not cheating if it works <laughs> and you're open and honest about it. Um, in that situation, I had a ring light and on my, on my 90, on my camera, on a tripod, on a really long remote and then a nice good book because I sat there for a really, really long time. <laughs> um, but most of the time, you know, you're going to use flash when you need really fast shutter speeds. You know, use a high speed sync to try to get, um, you know, butterfly wings or bee wings tack sharp or something like that. Uh, but most of the time, I don't feel like I need it. It's a style that isn't mine. Yeah, LEDs are really nice nowadays, too. It is nice to see it as you're lighting it up as well. Mm -hmm. so, but it can definitely be the patience game with uh, animals and bugs, though. I totally understand that. <laughs> uh, let's they see. never go where you want them to. Right, exactly. Like they never, sugar down to, or something. You never want to be right in front of that lens where you're aiming it, right? Mm -mm. I've tried to shoot bees before, and that, that's a lot of fun. So we have one more question here. Um, sometimes my lens cannot focus on what I want. Am I too close? What to do when lens in autofocus mode? <sighs> there are a lot of variables in that question. Um, most commonly, it's gonna be one of two things. Either you're too close to your subject. So if it's a zoom lens, you know, figure out what that minimum focusing distance is and make sure you're zoomed all the way out like we talked about. Um, if it's a if it's a macro lens again figure out what its minimum focusing distance is and you know make sure you're not within that more commonly we're going to find that it's it's a lack of contrast issue so if you know especially with with flower leaves or you know butterfly wings or something like that there's not a lot of contrast it's just one solid color and lenses need contrast to be able to find focus so the best tip there is to either find an edge and move your focus point to an edge and that'll hopefully help snap it into place um, or just use your manual focus and and fine tune it there i love live view with macro photography because you can actually uh, magnify your live view five times and then ten times and really get that focus to tack sharp where you want it i talk with my hands awesome. yeah that is really <laughs> nice to, to fine tune your focus i'll use mm -hmm. uh, manual focus i was going to just add, um, sometimes that can be really nice to find that minimum focus distance too. Um, yeah. And then you can always still autofocus, of course, but um, sometimes when you're right on that edge and you're not sure if you're getting too close, that might help you out. 
So. And some of these cameras too, um, to, to add to that point, I know that on the Sony a7 III, uh, it does it where you can, you know, if you half press um, the button and, and start manually focusing, it will shoot in, like zoom into your, your subject so you can actually see, you know, the, oh, that, that kind of fine point coming yeah. to focus. So um, I'm sure that the, uh, the new, you know, Z and R systems probably similar. Um, yeah. Similar features. Yeah, a lot of those have some very similar focus assists and things like that. So yeah. Very cool. Well, I don't see any other questions in chat. Lynn said, thank you. Another great informative fun class. Thanks especially to Jillian. So thank you everybody for coming here. And thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Ben, for coming out and doing another class presentation with us. That was really good info. So of course. Yeah, yeah no, we we absolutely love doing them and um yeah, everybody uh you know just tune in and, and stay tuned, I guess, uh, to the uh, next week, we'll have another uh, webinar on Thursday. So um, yeah, I was gonna say definitely check out that's a great resource that Tamron's putting together with the EDU. Uh, Action Camera also has some more classes coming up. And then we are working with Tamron again. So we'll see you all next week. That is on Thursday, May 21st, also at 11am. And that is on the mysteries of night photography. So that'll be a really fun class as well. Oh, that's a uh, good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a fun one. Yeah, that yeah. should be a really fun topic as well. So um, if there's no other questions, though, I'll just say thank you again so much for coming out. Um, we are recording this. So I'll get that link out to everybody after this. So if you want to review that, um, uh, you'll have this content you can use. So and uh, hopefully everybody has a great day and contact Action Camera if you have any other questions.